Hey guys, um, so we're going to be looking at Jeremiah 11 today. So let's open up in prayer and we can get started. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We thank you for who you are. We glorify you. We ask God right now that you would grace us with your presence, that you would be here with us. Help us, Lord God, anoint our eyes and our ears and our minds and help us to receive what you have for us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. So here we go. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeys not the words of this covenant. That I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them. According to all that I command you, you so shall be my people and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath that I swore to your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I and said, so be it, O Lord. I want to talk about that because that's amazing. In verse 4, this whole thing, um, God is just um, doing a recap of how ever since he brought them out of Egypt, He's just wanted to have a covenant with them. And he's been um, crying out to them to obey the commands that he has given him so that he could be their God and they would be his people. And he's wanting them to listen to what he said, not because he's an egotistical tyrant. Verse 5 tells us why. So that I may perform the oath that I swore to your fathers. I have all this goodness and all these blessings and all this favor that I promised your forefathers I would give to you if you obeyed my voice. So please just do what I've said. Lots of parents can understand this point because I have wonderful things to give you. So can you just start acting right? Because I want to give them to you. And Jeremiah was in agreement. So be it, Lord. That's amen. Verse 6. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, and say, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. That's uh, just like in James, that it's not good enough to just be a hearer of the word, but we need to be a doer of the word. So he's saying, Hear the words of the covenant and then do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even to this day, rising early, protesting, saying, Obey my voice, but they wouldn't obey it or listen, but walked every one in the imaginations of their evil heart. That's why I brought all upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I made with their fathers. Verse 11, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them that they will not be able to escape. And though they shall cry to me, I will not listen to them. So God is saying that all this time they refuse to listen to him. So now when they want to come crying to him, he is going to refuse to listen to them. 
Verse 12, then shall the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry to the gods whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them. I guess, guess why? Huh? I wonder why. They shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble because you're praying to a stick. Verse 13, for according to the number of your cities, are the number of your gods, O Judah. And according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. At the end of the chapter, we're going to get more into some things about Baal worship. Some things that you may not know, may not have been told. I don't know if anyone's told you. So I want to tell you. Verse 14. Therefore, pray not for this people, neither lift up a cry of prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry to me for their trouble. What hath my beloved to do in my house, seeing she has wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee. What are you doing standing in my house when you done slept with everybody and now you want to come home to me and ask me for something? Are you crazy? When it says the holy flesh is passed from thee, that was her hymen. She's not a, you're not a virgin anymore. You done went and that's long gone, them days. Done slept with everybody. Now you want to come back to me now that you're in trouble. When you do evil, then you rejoice. You think it's fun to go get drunk and fornicate and do all this stuff and then come stand in my house. You think it's fun to get caught up in all this sin and then play church. Come in here and act holy like you're saved or something. Verse 16, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair with goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So it's saying that initially God referred to Israel as this olive tree. Okay, a green olive tree. And so I looked this up to see. And so um, olive tree, um, they're just beautiful and majestic. And they're big. And they are used for so many things. They're used for food, um, all different kinds of oil. They use it for oil for their lamps, anointing oil, um, in oil in their sacrifices, you can use the trunk and the branches in that for furniture. Um, it'll usually in the trunks are sturdy and they'll have these knots, big knots in it. And just, man, it's just beautiful. And um, so what happens is uh, they have flowers that bloom that are so beautiful. And then they'll bloom. And then after they fade, then the olives come. But it's just beautiful. And that's what God referred to and that oil um, represents the Holy Ghost and just amazing and beautiful. And that's how God referred to Israel. That's what he called her. But then it's saying there's a great tumult and he's burning the tree down. It's all broken. He's setting that thing on fire because it's good for nothing. Verse 17, for the Lord of hosts that planted you Again, this tree analogy has pronounced evil against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. Again, with the Baal worship. And the Lord has given me knowledge of it and I know it. Then you showed me their doings. So Jeremiah was in a time of prayer, and that's what God will do to his people for those 
who are prophets and others with other, sometimes with other giftings. God will just, um, whoever's heart is willing and open at the time, he will just download information into you and let you know what things are being done behind closed doors. And he will reveal things to you. And so that's what he did to Jeremiah. He let Jeremiah know what they were doing in secret. And you know that was a spiritual gift from God because Jeremiah can't see through walls. <laughs> he wouldn't have any idea what was going on, but God told him. Verse 19, this is Jeremiah talking, and he said, But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me. They were scheming against Jeremiah, and God told him. And they were saying, let us destroy the tree with the fruit of it and let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name will be remembered no more. They were plotting to kill him and to take his life. 20, but O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, that tries the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. It was not, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was not praying that way. He was saying, I want to see. After all I've been through, after all I've done for these people, and we're going to get more in, in depth in the coming chapters about what exactly that they put him through. And you have to understand, like, we're only in chapter 11 but you have to understand that Jeremiah, this book covered 40 years. Jeremiah prophesied approximately 40 years to these people, if you can imagine that, saying the same things over and over and over. And they don't listen, and they're plotting to kill them, and they throw them in prison, and they beat them, and all this stuff. And sometimes the intercessor gets fed up and wants to see something happen. Like, I've been doing this and put myself out here. I'm sick of these people. And then you got God sometimes going, I've been doing this and reaching out, and I'm sick of these people. <laughs> and so it works out better when, you know, the intercessor and God are kind of on the offset <laughs> so they can encourage each other. And God's sick of the people. Like Moses came and said, Lord, remember? And he interceded for them. And God was like, okay, and changed his mind. And then there's times where the intercessor was like, dude, let them all fry. Let the sons of thunder, let lightning come down, kill them all. And, you know, obviously Jesus didn't do that. And so, you know, those are those off times. But when God and the intercessor are like, we're done with these people, that's really not a good time. So Jeremiah said, let me see thy vengeance on them for unto thee have I revealed my cause. That is the best thing. That is the most important thing. We talked about this. Um, so when you have someone who is plotting and scheming against you, when you're doing what's right, when you're preaching the truth, when you're doing what God has called you to do, and there are people plotting and scheming and, you know, just whatever against you, that's what you do is you take it to God. You don't fight for yourself. You don't take vengeance. Look at um, Jeremiah. I want to see your vengeance on them. Jeremiah didn't do anything to, to fight. Didn't go around trying to prove himself. Give his side of the story. Nope. He just always went to God. Look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. And he stayed with a right heart. And he stayed doing what he was supposed to be doing. And that's why God blessed him and helped him. That's what you do. You give it all to God. You let him deal with it, and he will. Verse 21, therefore, uh, these last couple chapter uh, verses, the last, last couple verses, um, I'm going to read to you, and then we're going to delve into it because it's something significant and pretty sad um, that you wouldn't understand unless you research. That's why it's good to research. Verse 21, therefore, thus saith the Lord to the men of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, prophesy not in the name of the Lord that you don't die by our hand. Can you imagine that? Shut up if you want to live. That's what they told Jeremiah. These men of Anathoth, keep that in mind. The men of Anathoth told Jeremiah, 
don't prophesy in the name of the Lord or else you'll die by our hand. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and daughters will die by famine. And there will be no more remaining of them because I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. Remember we talked about in the Bible, a visitation from God was never a good thing. And so um, these men of Anathoth, I looked it up and I'm so glad I did because it puts a whole different spin on it. So these men of Anathoth are the ones that are leading the charge to kill Jeremiah. They want him dead. Why? It tells us for prophesying in the name of the Lord. They don't want to hear that they got to change. They don't want to hear the truth. And so it's to the extent that they're scheming and planning and plotting to kill Jeremiah because he won't shut up talking and telling them that they're living wrong and preaching the truth. What is Anathoth? A city. What is that city? So I looked it up. Anathoth was a city set aside for Levites. These are the ministers of God Almighty who serve in his house that are plotting the whole city has banded together to kill God's prophet. That's what we see happening today. Whenever someone is speaking the truth, someone is being exposed, then all a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of them that followed them or liked them don't want to hear it. And they'll accuse you of causing division when you speak against it because they don't want to hear it because they're deceived in their minds. So we see in Jeremiah, I talked to you, and that's what we're going to end with today, that they did all this worship of Baal. I'm going to tell you why it was so disgusting. The worship of Baal, Baal was... There's different varieties of him. Different nations worshipped Baal. Had their own idea of him. But he was basically all around the god of storm and fertility. The weather and fertility. So, the reason that it was so evil when the Israelites came to worship Baal is because their worship, you know, we worship God. So we just come and lift our hands and dance and sing, play instruments. That's not what they do in Baal worship. In Baal worship, they have sex with everybody and they are drinking and doing all kinds of crazy things, all kinds of perverted lewdness that you could think of in the temple. So premarital sex, homosexual acts, all in the temple of Almighty God. Now, there are different things in society today, different ideas and beliefs, but I'm telling you that God is God and he never changes. And homosexuality is a sin. Just like premarital sex is a sin. We don't hate people. We hate sin. And we don't want it done. And we especially don't want it done in God's own house. And so we need to be pure when we come to Christ. The problem is that we want to take things that we did in the world and bring them to God. We can still do it and worship God. No, you can't. All through scripture, and you can look it up for yourself, there are too many to list. God is continually telling his people to not do the deeds of the people around them. Don't worship him the way other people worship their idols. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Be different. 
you cannot bring that trash and that perversion into God's house, into being a Christian, and somehow think you can make it holy, slap the name of Jesus on it, and some and somehow you're okay. So this is what I want to say. I'm going to end by saying this. Maybe you weren't taught this. Maybe you don't know this. But I'm going to say this and you can pray. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to offer you some facts. You can do some research yourself. This is not my opinion. This is easily researched fact. Anal sex is perverted and disgusting and it should not be done by a child of God. It is vile and it is a homosexual act. Just because it's done between a man and a woman doesn't make it right. It's rooted in Baal worship, homosexuality. When you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, who got destroyed, partly there were other sins involved, not just homosexuality, but homosexuality was a horrid problem there. And it was rooted in their Baal worship. That was an act of worship that they did in the temple to Baal. So you cannot come and have anal sex, I don't care if you're married, and try to say, this is holy in God when you are doing an act that is evil and from paganism. You cannot do it. When two people have natural sex in God's order, a man and his wife, it is joyful and good and pleasurable. If there's something wrong, that's a rare thing that's something not working right. If you need some type of stuff to help it not hurt so much or whatever the case is, that sometimes happens, but that's not the norm. There's something wrong and not working right. However, in the act of anal sex, there is nothing ever good. In, you have to fake so much. You have to lube so much. You have to do all this other stuff to try to even make it manageable. And then there are physical consequences. You can look it up of how damaging it is. All the stuff you're leaking out of your body regularly. All the damage it's causing to your body because it is wrong. And it's not, that's not what your butt was made for. And that is just the fact. That was not the reason that God gave you a behind. And these are things that you can look up how much, especially dangerously, more it is for women. Because the damage that it's done and how much it's on the rise. And nobody wants to say anything because they don't want to seem judgmental or homophobic. I'm going to tell you right now, it's wrong. It's evil. It's vile in God's eyes and in medical, but they just don't want to say nothing. But how much um, it's on the rise of women having problems and their health is at risk for doing that. It is not right. And it is not good for you to do. In the Bible, you will see natural sex. You can have all erotic, Song of Solomon. They included fruit and had all outside and had all kinds of fun. You can find oral sex in the Bible. You are not going to find anal sex because it is, except it talks about the homosexual sex in the Baal worship. That's all that it was. It was never part of God's design. Highly suspect anybody who thinks that's okay or normal and claims to be a Christian. That is suspect right there. So I'm sorry someone had to say it. I love you guys and I hope you have a good night. God bless you. Bye-bye.